My OBGYN told me I had no right having children as an HIV positive woman. Hello to everyone in the DMV and beyond. Welcome to another episode of Positive Voices. I'm your co-host Malachi Stewart. Hey, and I'm T. Pearson Hall. Hey, T. You're looking good today. Girl. Oh, so do you, baby. Thank you, baby. Listen, so today we are going to talk about pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And as a person who's worked in HIV for a while, um, a lot of the time people don't People sometimes get so caught up in the virus, they forget about the people. Yeah. Right? Like, we out here living regular lives. We're having... People are having babies. Now, as much as I have announced on social media, I actually cannot get pregnant. <laughs> so, I what? definitely want to give space to our guests. Please introduce <laughs> yourself so we can get into your stories. My name is Martha Cameron. My name is Robin Thomas. Hello, Ms. Martha. Hello, Ms. Robin. Hello. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome. Welcome. Yes, to yes, yes. So, what can you... i start with you. So, what can you tell us about yourself? Well, I'm a community health educator working in the field of HIV, and I've been doing it for 13 years now. Okay. And um, not the job I would have chosen. (laughs) Just like, um, you know, testing HIV positive was definitely challenging, you know, and it, 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 it's, you have to be very, very strong to survive that. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. Mentally strong. Yeah. Not just physically, but mentally, because it really will challenge you to the core. But um, I tested positive when I was pregnant with my baby girl. She's 27 now. So it's it's um, been quite a few years now. And um, such a crazy time, because I was in a 14-year relationship and really didn't think that I was at risk, mm. you know. And um, he did something kind of crazy and went to jail. And this is what I do know. He was locked up for six months. He went in negative and he came out HIV positive. Okay. We came together as usual. And um, I immediately got pregnant after, you know, us, him coming home. And um, when I was about four months pregnant, I went to the doctor to do prenatal care. And they tested me for HIV and the test came back positive. And it was... That was horrible. So, excuse me for a second. I just want to make sure I grab it and therefore they grab it as well. Mm-hmm. So, it sounds like you, your experience was kind of like a, a most, well, not most, but some black women mm-hmm. who don't find out their status until they go to the OB Absolutely. for pregnancy. Absolutely. So, you found out you were having a baby and that you had HIV in the same conversation. Absolutely. But this is the thing, though. Um he and I had been together for 14 years, so this is our third child. So mm. that's why I know it had to happen when um, he was incarcerated okay. because I had tested negative with the other children. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So it was a really hard place to be in. But absolutely, I found out after, you know, I was expecting, mm. which is, you know, um, a challenge in itself, you know, to be carried a baby and then find out that you're HIV positive. But um, back in that time, things were so much different because they didn't know how to treat a HIV positive woman to be sure that the child did not, you know, become positive. Because um, just a little short story, my neighbor lived across the street and um, me and her used to talk all the time. And one day, I, I look across the street, and she had a baby. Mm. And I said, um, I didn't know you was expecting. She said, no, I wasn't. She said, but my sister is incarcerated, and I agreed to take care of her baby. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, I used to see her and this baby all the time. And after about seven months, the baby passed. Mm. And um, she never did say that when, you know, I had seen her with the baby all the times. But what she said to me was, her sister was positive, and the baby was born infected. Mm. Now, imagine this. I'm seven months pregnant. Right. And wow. um, when that baby died, fear, and, and I, I was just so overwhelmed with fear because, you know, my thing was I truly hope that my child is not born with the virus as well because, mm-hmm. you, you know, at that time they didn't know how to prevent it. Mm-hmm. So it, it was a crazy time. But, you know, we made it through. And um, what was remarkable was, um, and also, if say if you had a baby and you was HIV positive, did you know for two years they ran all kinds of tests and draw blood to make sure that that baby did not um, test positive? 
Wow, I didn't Absolute, know that. Yeah, back so in that time. So you had to take your daughter back and forth to, was it at the hospital? or like Yeah, your, at the hospital. The and guess what else? My baby was on AZT from the time of birth. Because you were positive. Because I was positive. So even without knowing her status or testing They put her on anything. AZT because they were saying that even if she was going to convert yeah. and become positive, this would be something that could possibly help to prevent that. But that was really, really hard because um, her quality of life was horrible. And I, I say that because my baby cried constantly, mm. you know. It didn't matter whether she was changed, bathed, she was fed. So I imagine, now AZT was hard for adults. Yeah. So yes. it had to be hard on her system, you know, and... Um, I'm going to be honest with you, I, I, I could only do it for like four months. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't do it anymore because she cried constantly, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I prayed about it and just, you know, I held her a lot and she is rotten, even today. She's mm -hmm. rotten, you know. Just love extra. Don't stay <laughs> rotten. Don't do her like that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really spoiled, I really spoiled her because I told her other brothers and sisters, if you see her doing something, just divert her. Don't. Don't spank her and don't yell at her, but you know, I was concerned about her from the time she was born. But mm. she's she's doing well and she never did test positive. Mm. So okay. it was a really crazy time. And it was a it was a lot of, of stress, you know, being pregnant and being HIV positive. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Um as you talk about the fear. You you mentioned something when you talked about your previous partner, um, her father, mm -hmm. coming out of jail and you came together as usual, as you said, mm -hmm. because you didn't think that you had any risk because you yes. were a straight Absolutely. woman yeah. having sex with what yes. you presumed as a man who only has sex with women. Yes. And just because we know, like, here in the DMV, like here in D.C., we know, like, the second most likely mm -hmm. is black women. We know that the prevalence of HIV among black women who are cisgendered, who are heterosexual, mm -hmm. who have sex with men mm -hmm. is higher than if you were a white man who was having Absolutely. sex with men. I think your representation is important. Yes. And you talked about also like, you know, finding out why you were pregnant. Martha, my understanding is that your, your experience with pregnancy and HIV was a little different. Tell us a little bit about the, how you contracted HIV, kind of that, and like how that related to pregnancy for you. Yes, uh, sure. So um, I'm actually originally from Africa okay. um, and a country called Zambia, which is in sub-Saharan Africa and was basically, and I think still is, the epicenter of the HIV epidemic. Okay. Um, it was very hard hit. We lost a lot of people. Um, my generation, uh, very few of us can say we still have our parents. Mm. Um, and I, Sarah, converted in two uh, 2003. Um, and so it was a little later mm -hmm. than Robin. And, um, but, you know, without, you know, sharing all the horror stories about what I went through, you know, I had a T cell count of two, that's zero two. Mm. Um, and so essentially they thought I would be dead within several, um, months, wow. uh, if that, um, and of course, you know, uh, Africa is always the last to get medications and, and things like that. But um, God had other plans because 2003 is when um, the United States government actually sent aid to Africa in the form of the presidential emergency fund. Okay. And so I was able to get treatment and uh, fast forward to a time when the... Um, I think the worst thing that could have happened to me other than HIV was the fact that I would not have been able to be a mother. Mm. Um, okay. You know, the, the, the scenario in Africa, there is an expectation of, of, of marriage, obviously, uh, in our society. But I, I had also just known that I was going to be a mother from the time mm -hmm. I was very young. And so... Um, even though I was HIV positive, I was um, ended up being blessed to find a man who could marry me, which again very unusual mm -hmm. um, in in the date in the time that I was you know uh, living and mm -hmm. in in the place I was at. HIV is very stigmatized. They know you're HIV positive, you're unapproachable. Wow. Um, but I was able to get married, and I knew that I wanted to have children. Mm -hmm. um, and the doctors were talking about research 
that was happening to the extent that they were saying they could prevent mother to child transmission. Okay. We're trying not to call it that now because it's stigmatizing language. It's called vertical transmission. Mm -hmm. But there was now, at least by then, established that if a mother was on, on, on treatment, she would not pass the virus on to her child. Yes. But again, this was still sort of in research, and I'll mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about why I'm passionate about that, because it enabled me to have children. Mm -hmm. And so they had understood that the, 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 the mother wouldn't be able to pass on the virus, um, but also still that even though a child was born negative, they still had to give that age a T, mm -hmm. but for a shorter time, for six months as opposed to two years. Okay. Um, and there was also research being done, again, still had not been established mm -hmm. that if you were uh, positive, you might not pass on the virus to your partner. Okay. And so even that was an early experiment, mm -hmm. you yes. know, for us to have unprotected sex um, in order to have children was, um, you might call it courageous. I, I think it was pretty scary yeah. for us to do because I was not only thinking about the potential of passing this virus on to my child, I was also thinking about the potential of passing this virus on to my partner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so you, you, you have to live through that. The doctors are saying, look, we're seeing that there's absolutely, uh, uh, it's being established that there's prevention of mother to child transmission. You'll be okay. We're seeing that. It hadn't been you because you did not exist in 2003, right. but they were already seeing that if somebody mm -hmm. was on, you know, so they encouraged us and said, you could do this. Mm -hmm. And so we did. Um, and so we had sex the regular old fashioned way in order to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you, it really did wear on my mental health. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it really did wear on where I would have nightmares about, you know, either my child being positive, us dying, mm -hmm. the times that my partner would go to get tested just to check. And we would have to wait in those days, no rapid tests. You yes. would have to wait a couple of days um, were the mm -hmm. hardest days. I would be staring at this person and saying, so what would you do? Mm -hmm. You know, what will you, what will you tell me what you really will do and what you really will feel, you know, if you were to turn out positive. Absolutely. Um, and, and they would tell me, well, you know what, I'll just start taking the medication like you are. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they used to say that in order to calm me down. But yeah, hardest nine months ever um, to be able to go through that. But the most beautiful thing is having um, the two children that are both HIV negative mm -hmm. uh, are now 14 and 12 mm -hmm. um, and thriving. Yes. 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 How my heart feels for that. Because mm -hmm. um, I'm a mom. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I was like, okay, we're going to talk to some other moms. And so I, um, I just go back to the moment that I found out I was pregnant, right? Mm -hmm. And just this joyous information. But I also think of times when I lost children mm -hmm. and it wasn't as joyous, right? And just when I hear you all speak about experience, I bring in that thought as a mom and you're carrying it and your baby moving, but is it moving as much as it's supposed to, right? I can mm -hmm. just imagine. So how did you guys transition, right? Where where did that space come from of this is how I found out and this is my child and like I have to make these decisions for my child in addition to my decisions for myself. Where did you pull that strength from? Where did that come from to still be able to mother, but like mother yourself, right, in the process? Well, I want to say that um, I do have four children. Okay. So, yes. yes. And so um, it wasn't, in my mind, I think failure wasn't an option, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, I had to stay sane because, you know, I imagined that I had to be there for my children. Mm -hmm. You know, when you when you a mother, you always put your children first, mm -hmm. you know. And then I didn't want to think about other people having an opportunity to raise my children. Part, yeah. I wanted to be there, yeah. you know. So my prayer was, Lord, let me get through this and let me be here to see my children get old enough to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Because, let's see, 27 years ago, I had known some people that was positive, but I will say this, that... Um, Quite a, I, I knew a lot of people who had died of AIDS, yeah. you know, and that was that was kind of scary in itself. Yeah. And so, you know, I, 
I, I grappled with how long would I be here to take care of them. But, you know, the most amazing thing is 27 years later, they're all grown. And now I'm here loving all my grandchildren. And that is just amazing Hello. to me. Because yes. I never thought I would last as long. Like, for instance, I've been wearing, look, I've been wearing a wig for like five or six years, right? Because my hair had gotten gray and everything. Mm -hmm. And I was having some little issues with it. I snatched that wig off about three months ago. I said, you know what? Hello. I didn't even know I would be here. <laughs> Hello. And you worried about a wig. What you but say? We only, outside. But not only that, I think about the fact that I grew up with a lot of people who are not here and it had yeah. nothing to do with HIV. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And some people that knew my status probably thought that I wouldn't be here, you know, for a long time. Yeah. So I'm just grateful. So I would say holding on for my children was important to me. Okay. You know what I mean? And so that gave me the strength to keep on pressing on. Thank you for that. Um, well, I can barely talk about this journey without including my faith. Mm -hmm. You know, I think everybody has their higher power mm -hmm. and we all have to hold on to that. But I got to tell you that I think in, you know, and I have the two experiences, have having the one child in Africa and having the second child here. Mm -hmm. And you tend to face, uh, you tend to need more strength. I think mm -hmm. here in, in the U.S. as a person who's a minority, as a person who might be of low income, mm -hmm. which when I came here I was, mm -hmm. I was depending on the Ryan White uh, fun, uh, funding and care to get my medication, and your child is immediately designated a Medicaid um, um, recipient when the child is born. And so... Um, the first thing that happens when you're pregnant here as an HIV positive woman is you're declared high risk mm. with immediate effect. Okay. And before that, even when I approached my OBGYN, and this might not be everybody's experience, and this is why I do what I do in terms of advocacy, um, is because my OBGYN told me I had no right having children as an HIV positive woman, wow. especially of the social economic status that I was. And she offered to tie my tubes immediately after this child was born, assuming I wanted to carry it through. Wow. So she was very clear about the position that I was in and held that position until the very last day when I was having my C-section. Now, as an HIV positive woman, up until very recently, um, it was... Um, the standard procedure for you to have um, a, a cesarean section. Okay. Um, and they have changed that. You can now have natural birth. Again, in the advent of the research that has led to U equals U and, um, and that you wouldn't, and prevention from mother to child transmission. Because of my fear, I, I continued to have C-sections even after that decision was made. But up until that day on the operating mm -hmm. table, um, she um, indicated that she needed to tie my tubes and I told her she had no right to. Yeah. Um, there's a lot more that happens with um, especially black women, um, you know, until very recently, actually up until January 31st of 2023, uh, women living with HIV were not allowed to breastfeed. Um, mm. in this country, even though that has been done for over 20 years, again, yeah. in the in, in, in the rest of the world, partly because, you know, the women there could not afford formula, mm -hmm. but also because the research had been done to show that there was very little, less than 1% transmission wow. uh, through breast milk. It has been done. But in the U.S., they decided to keep that standard. And so women did not, you know, have that choice. Mm. And so if you are opting to breastfeed, breast and chest feed, and we use inclusive language now, um, you were um, at uh, risk of being uh, criminalized for that. So they would have to call the standard uh, for most hospitals was to call Child Protection Services wow. because then they would say that you're putting your child at risk. Wow. So in addition to just your personal mental health of mm -hmm. being pregnant and carrying a child mm -hmm. and yes. thinking about all those things that go with it, there are these external factors mm -hmm. that... Um, challenge you uh, because your ob is saying, you know, you need to have your tubes tied. You should not be having children. Yeah. You're going to be stressing the system. And then that also will call Child Protective Services. And the health department did come knocking on my door to make sure the child was taking the AZT and the fact that I was not um, uh, breastfeeding. Wow. So these are the, the reasons why 
well, first of all, why I'm here, mm -hmm. but also why we want to reach young women because even the younger uh, women now who are vertical, so these are uh, young women who had were born with HIV and now having children, okay. mm -hmm. um, and that's Absolutely. beautiful. Mm -hmm. And we still have young, you know, younger women who are at most risk, the highest diagnosis uh, among our adolescent and young adult populations, we want them to be empowered to know that they can advocate for themselves. Yes. It is absolutely not necessary for anyone to stop you having a child yes. if you're HIV positive. You do not need to go through the stress um, of even thinking about transmission because if, if you do things right, mm -hmm. because we're standing on the shoulders of giants who have been through their research mm -hmm. and have shown absolutely. that this is not possible. Yeah. And then there's absolutely no need for Child Protective Services to ever approach you mm -hmm. um, or put you at risk for, you know, whatever it is, yeah. because you have the space and the advocacy and the policies to protect you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, some of it just don't make sense to me, right? And so I apologize, right? Because uh, I think about, so for a disease, right, or HIV and AIDS, that's something that you was contracted from having sex, right? And so when we think about all of these limitations and like these policies and things that, that isolate, it's, it's isolation because I'm diabetic, but when I go and have a child, it's just let me prick your finger, check your sugar, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. But it's not, oh, well, you need to make sure you feed your child, make sure your child don't eat starch, make sure your carbs is right for your child because then they can end up with diabetes too, right? Mm -hmm. And right. so it's like, how do, who picks and chooses, yeah. right, all of these different caveats for things of like, how can you tell a mother, I can't really mother the way that I know and the way that I've been raised to know mm -hmm. because you're going to tell me. How's she going to tell you that she's going to tie your tubes? Like, oh. I, I'm just still sitting with the privilege that certain people hold. Um, wow. I'm sorry. I just And that stigma. That, yes. Like, your reaction. I appreciate your reaction because... That's the reaction that's needed. I'm so surprised that people like hear these things and they sit in quiet like, or sit in calm. I'm like, y'all not outraged <laughs> about yes. something that is outrageous. Because how Absolutely. can you tell somebody that you don't have a right? Yes. Right? Now, I can go, I got my opinions about some people who don't need to have children. Right? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. We and see it's them, not about health We status. see them all day. <laughs> yeah. But it's not their, I don't know their health. Right? Yeah. I just know how they treat their children. Right? Yeah. Um, can I ask something? Yeesh. We talked about... So it's very clear to me, mm -hmm. and I'm not, I am not having worked in the field, surprised to hear that you got those responses from medical professionals. I would like to know from both of you, what was the social kickback? Yeah. Especially because you have two different experiences on the couch, right? Like, Robin, you found out why you were pregnant, but mm -hmm. you know how people are, yes. especially our people. And you made a decision, so I already know what they was given. What was the social, re like, social response mm -hmm. to being pregnant? Well, um, first of all, I like to say that... Um, I didn't talk about being um, HIV positive to anyone at that time mm. because there was so much stigma associated with being positive. And unlike Margaret, um, I opted to have my tubes tied because all of the things that I went through with um, having her and all of the things that she was going through with as far as the treatments and being on AZT and yeah. so forth and so on, and then not knowing if she would ever be positive. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to, you know, and then I had four children anyway, so that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. I really didn't tell anyone that I was positive for five years. Mm. And um, it was kind of a crazy time because I was um, dealing with a lot of depression. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I was still um, trying to move life forward and still trying to raise my children. So um, it was at the fifth year. <laughs> I'm telling you, when I, after I woke up five years it's straight like, every right. day, I was like, you know what? Um, I didn't even know. And not only that, I was not sick, you mm. know. So that made a difference, too. Mm -hmm. And I, after a while, I said, you know what? I'm pretty much wasting time here. Because I could have accomplished more with the five years besides just take care of my children and take care of my home and so forth and so on. Do you know at the fifth year, I went back to school and started college? Hey, now. Because I was like, you know what? 
when it's all said and done, <laughs> if I haven't done anything with my life, it's my own fault. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So somebody said, if you don't like, um, okay, so write your own obituary is yeah. what I read. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like what you write about yourself, <laughs> then it's time to get busy. You know yeah. what I mean? So that you will have a, a, a decent story to tell when it's all over because it's appointed to all of us to go. You know what I mean? But what, what will your life say? How will your life speak about you? And so I said, you know what? I'm going to school. And, you know, the best thing I could have ever, ever done for myself because, you know, um, I'm, I'm just so grateful today that, you know, um, I had um, a kind of uh, an epiphany, mm -hmm. you know, I ain't did yet, so let me start living. And so, no, I didn't deal with a lot of stigma at that time because no one knew. Mm -hmm. But I came, it came to a place in my life that um, I have faith in the Lord, too. I, I, I go to church and love the Lord. But it came to a time that um, I think I was um, pressed in my spirit to start talking about my story. Hmm. Because I knew so many people who were suffering in silence, mm -hmm. you know. And it came to a point where the Lord began to deal with me about being open about being positive. And I'll never forget, um, um, I said, I was in the shower and he was speaking to me about talking more about being positive. And I remember I said, Lord, I can't do it. He said, I said, they're going to talk about me something terrible. He said, but they talked about me. Yeah, right. I love <laughs> and, um I remember, I, I remember like it was yesterday, he said, remember this, no matter what they say, no matter what they do, he said, they can't kick you out, put you out, or evict you. You are in the body of Christ. You are mine and I am yours. Mm -hmm. And I went and I told my pastor that and he was like, okay, okay. But look, when I went and told him, I was crying the whole time because I still wasn't on board with that yet. Yeah. But um, I was able to talk about it from the pulpit and I told a room full of 200 people. Mm. And um, what was amazing about that was, um, I forgot we was live streaming. Mm. And so by the time I sit down in my chair, the cat was really out the back. Yeah, you told more than 200 people, yeah. baby. <laughs> that phone was ding, ding, ding. Yeah, and yeah. Um, people was texting and telling me mm. thank you and so forth and so on. But you know, I will say this, I never felt more free in my whole entire life mm. yeah. when I was able to tell that, you know, that is what happened to me. Mm -hmm. But um, if you see a woman who's HIV positive, well, my story is I'm AIDS diagnosed as well, Margaret. Mm -hmm. But if you see that and that's all you see, you have missed it because there's so many layers mm. to who Robin really is. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah. Um, no, I will say that, you know, I haven't dealt much with the stigma in the sense that, you know, you have to have some tough skin mm -hmm. and get to the place where, you know what I say, what you think about me is none of my business. <laughs> it don't even really matter, you know. Yeah. And so I'm just going to move it forward. And I also um, facilitate a women's group and I tell them all the time, I say, look, nobody has the right to make you feel any kind of way. Mm -hmm. You know, well, you know, I told them, well, they found out I was positive and they said this and it made me feel, no, I, I don't give nobody hmm. the right to make me feel any kind of way about mm -hmm. myself. I love me some me. Hello. And it don't even really matter what you think about That's me. Yeah, I have yeah. to move my life forward. So, no, I don't participate in the stigma and I'm committed to helping women who are HIV positive feel okay with themselves. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I'm committed yeah. to it. Absolutely. What about you? Uh, well, um, stigma was very real. Um, and it's still very real. And I think uh, people underestimate um, the impact that that has on, you know, the decision to even test and then what happens after. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, we are social beings. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when... I, I was positive. I was very visibly sick. So they knew. And, mm -hmm. you know, just the same way we would have known. Um, so it wasn't very, you know, very difficult when, you know, for people to, to find you. And so you, you, you start feeling the stigma when you visit people yeah. and, you know, where it used to be family gatherings and you can see some of their reactions mm -hmm. in terms of people, that, the way they're interacting with you. Um, and, um, even with the church, I think as much as our community is so very connected with the church, a lot of us have religious trauma, yes. uh, not just for um, 
uh, being HIV positive, but here in the U.S., I've found even just for I think our identities and and, mm-hmm. and stuff, and and so a, a, a big deal for me um, it, when I got married, for example, I asked um, the 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 pastor that was presiding to say mm-hmm. if there were whispers, you know, I needed people to know he already knows she's HIV positive, oh, wow. and and then of course when the babies were coming, they were watching because mm-hmm. they expected these skinny or sick babies, Mm -hmm. you know, to be born. Mm -hmm. Um, But of course they were not, they were beautiful. And, you know, so that I don't need to say anything, right? Right. They, they, you know, they just watch and see, but that is now like a critical part of my work because I think some of the hardest things that are happening, especially among young people is this sort of spectrum of disclosure. Mm. Um, Relationships are so important and it really boils down to, how the other person feels. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been married for 16 years, but okay. it's still something that we barely talk about. Mm. You know, um, in spite of that, the, the babies have been gone and that's in our past now, but, you know, it's it's still something that's so hard to even relate to this person, mm. you know, who talks to me every day. It's, we never talk about it in family gatherings, even though people know. Mm-hmm. Um, and that continues to happen. So I tread very, very carefully, even when we're encouraging, um, especially our younger folks, to disclose and to address some of the trauma they have already dealt with mm-hmm. and they might still deal with mm-hmm. um, because it's going to come. And it, it, it's truly a spectrum. It, it's a journey that you have to go through. Um, and so, uh, but it's all with the idea that you want to share. There's nothing impossible, right? Yeah. You can have a relationship. Um, you can protect yourself several ways, mm-hmm. including the fact that your partner could be on pressure so that should not get in the way of a loving relationship. Um, and then um, that you can have a family um, mm-hmm. and yeah. however you choose to define, you know, and create your family. Mm-hmm. It's, there's nothing impossible now. Um, and I think it's finding that journey and that strength to not care yeah. about what other people might Absolutely. think or say. Mm. That's yeah. so yes. important. Yeah. Thank yes. you. Uh, a question for you, Miss mm-hmm. um, Robin. So as we, you were talking, you said that you stayed silent for five years. Mm-hmm. Within that silence, do you think that some of that silence played a role in like the nosy stigma of like now if you say you're positive, then it's like you have to protect his secret or what happened to him because you contracted it from your partner who went away, came home, and now you you know, have a life, a life shift. Mm-hmm. Do you think part of that five years of silence was dealing with that? Like you oh, processing absolutely. that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I was afraid to um, speak about um, being positive, but make no mistake about it. HIV broke us up. That ah. was that was it, you right. know. Hello, what I you mean, say? Okay. absolutely, because um, you know I didn't have any other partner, so I didn't have to guess about where the transmission mm. came from. I knew that mm-hmm. you know the transmission came from him, and so we weren't together anymore. And um, that was kind of crazy because what what he initially told his family was that um, um, I was in in a relationship or having sex with someone when he was locked, locked up. up. Yeah. So Child. he threw it back on you. Yeah, he did. He did. Child. But five years later, he got very, very, very sick. Mm. And um, he was diagnosed. Hmm. And so his family was like, wow, she was telling the truth. So hold on. Wait a minute, Miss Robin. Hold on. So he came home. You found out when you were pregnant. Mm -hmm. So he never knew even then? Like he didn't go get tested once you found out? Um... I'm pretty sure he didn't. Wow. I'm pretty sure he didn't. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he didn't. But um, I knew that he was aware that he probably was in contact with an, an, another male that could possibly. I'm sure at that yeah. point. He but, you know, a lot of up, people yeah. like to be in denial, yeah. you know. So, no, that wasn't important, you know, because as long as uh, he was feeling okay and doing okay, I don't think that was a priority. Hmm. And then, like I said, he told a story about, you know, oh, well, she was with somebody. It was you out yeah, there, Master. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, wow. And so, you know, 
But yeah, I did have a lot of issues with stigma. I really did. And that's why I didn't talk about it for five years, you know. And so, you know, worried about what people was going to say. And then, mm -hmm. you know, also what people was going to say about my child. It was really, really a tough time, you mm -hmm. know. But I, I really am an advocate for what don't kill you make you stronger. Mm -hmm. And so today, you know, I'm just so grateful that, you know, that is behind me and I survived it. Yes. Because I, um, I help in my work. I work with a lot of um, women who are positive and, you know, some people never recover. Yeah. You know, some people deal with stick and, and, and it doesn't matter. Like, for instance, there are people who's been positive for 20 years. They're in denial, they haven't accepted it, mm -hmm. and they're still dealing with stigma. Mm -hmm. But you have to get to a place where you, um, first of all, you accept what has happened, mm -hmm. you forgive yourself. Hello. Then you, you hold up, and then you forgive. A lot of times, women know where the transmission came from, too. Okay. So you, you have to forgive that person as well, you know, because when you hold all of that stuff in, it's, it's actually self, you self-destruct, hmm. you know. And it's the reason why so many people use, yeah. you know, drink and, you know, um, don't really care about themselves, you know, or, and, and don't do the things that they need to do to take care of themselves. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I suffered with that for a while, but I'm just so grateful that that's behind me now. And I talk about HIV so much now. <laughs> <laughs> I could be in a grocery store mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I might say something about, you know, um, my work or, you know, being positive and people will look at me and, you know, because I'm at a place where I'm comfortable in my yeah. skin. Yeah. It does not really yeah. matter to me what someone else is saying. You I know, I'm, I'm comfortable in my skin. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Can I say something about that? Um, I know Absolutely. We, we don't have much time and I definitely want to give you opportunity to both say at least one thing mm -hmm. to people, to a woman out there mm -hmm. thinking about pregnancy, if she's HIV positive or just found out she was pregnant. I definitely want to give you that space. Mm -hmm. But it, it would be like, remiss for me not to say on this platform that I remember years ago, and I'll be brief, just working um, at whatever organization that was we were working at together. Mm -hmm. okay. And being in a space where I was comfortable now sharing about my status, mm -hmm. but the professional advice, and I don't know if you remember at that time, it was like, you get to be two people. You can mm -hmm. be the person that's talking about your experience, mm -hmm. and that's going to limit the amount of money you make and the track that your career goes mm -hmm. on. You can be the person supporting it, but you don't, to be both, you're not going to really be able to find it. I wasn't, mm -hmm. I remember in that role, I was telling you like, you know, Robin, I want to share yes. and I couldn't find my space and I couldn't find my voice. Mm -hmm. And so we talk a lot about how we stand on the shoulders of giants mm -hmm. um, to have you here on, on this platform where now it's been so many years where I'm doing which, what I saw you doing back then. Mm -hmm. I just needed to say thank you for being a giant who lended a shoulder mm -hmm. for me to stand. But I needed to give you that while you were here. Yes. Um, and with that said, <laughs> if you both thank could just you. briefly just give one thought, one thought to someone out there um, that is, is dealing with HIV and pregnancy, just some, one word of advice, one call to action, what would you both say? Um, yeah, so first of all is I think to know that it's it's not impossible anymore. It's not impossible for you to have a loving and fulfilling relationship without fear. And it's not impossible for you to get pregnant and have and have a baby. Um, and I, I didn't really get a chance to talk about my work and the research um, that we're doing. I've been, you know, uh, working in the community for a long time, but also working with a research and you you talked about standing on the shoulders of giants and I, I just want to invite especially young women to seek out and participate ways that they can contribute to something that can help them, mm. give them information about themselves, mm -hmm. their bodies, yeah. um, mm -hmm. as well as help other people. And mm -hmm. so um, I know that there's support groups and women's groups like mm -hmm. the one that Miss Robin is leading. But at, at the Georgetown Medical Center, we actually have a research going on for young women um, that helps them understand their reproductive health mm -hmm. and capacity. And this yeah. is not just for uh, positive women, it's for negative and positive women. It really helps you understand yourself, what's going on, what could happen, and it could help you and it could help others as well. So just know that it's not important possible. We're here. Mm -hmm. We are everywhere as mentors, as peers to support you. Um, but we're also help there to help you find out what is actually possible with you. Mm. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. For that. Yeah. And I just want to say um, education is key. Yes. You know, yeah. um, 
It's so important that you, um, how can you defeat your enemy unless you know what weapons it possess? Ooh. And that was important for me when I first tested positive. Mm. I said, you know what? I need to learn all I can learn about this thing called HIV because it's not what I heard people say or what I think about it, but just educating yes. myself. Once I educated myself and learned more about, you know, what, HIV really was, I felt more empowered. Mm -hmm. And so that's important to know today that first of all, you can have a healthy child, you know, mm -hmm. and um, you know, if you're undetectable, it means untransmittable. And so, you know, mm -hmm. I would say just education. That's that's so important. And speaking of education, Martha, you are, you are the statistics person. Because let me tell you something. She ain't just out here doing the work. She know the stats. That's why I was about if, to ask. If there's 10 women. Yes. If there are 10 women lined up, all of them are HIV positive, how many of those women would represent the amount of women that are HIV positive that are black? Nine. 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 That's nine 90% if you want to do some quick math. Nine out of 10 women in this region and specifically in the district are black women. And, and again, like you were saying, if you don't jump at that fact and ask why, and I can tell you a little bit more, we know that those women are located mostly in wards eight, ward seven, ward six, you know, and so lower income black lower women. Let's income. Just call it. Let's yes, right. just call it yeah. what it is. And you know, people used to when we started doing education. Uh, education is very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We wanted to take the blame off of the. It's not because you've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. It's because you're living in a location where yes. there is a high potential of you hooking up with someone or who being with positive. someone who is positive. Yes. That's and if you had that information then you would know how to take care of yourself. Mm. And I feel like we're not saying that enough to our, especially our young people yeah. in those areas. So it is really important to understand that this is truly, uh, HIV, especially in the district, is a racial justice issue. Mm -hmm. It truly is. Um, and so as, as black people, we need to understand we're more impacted. Mm. But again, due to no fault of our right. own, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's, it's, this stuff is systematic mm -hmm. and it is absolutely because we are living in a place where, you know, they call it double whammy. There's all kinds of things that can happen to you just because you're in a particular location. Powerful. The, it, it's, we are, DC is second in terms mm -hmm. of your, cap, your, your capacity to be able to contract HIV. Yes. So when we talk about prevention, we're well, second only to Baltimore. Mm -hmm. right. um, and, you know, if you go in, in the order of, you know, who is most like at risk, we know that our black gay brothers a very high at risk. And then mm -hmm. second, as you're saying in terms of two, it is our black heterosexual women. Yes. yes. So that is, is really, really, really important to know. Yes. That, you know, and it's not like you walk around the streets knowing, oh, you know, we're number two in the nation or, oh, you know, I have this risk ratio that is, that is or people don't even know that, don't even understand. You just live where you live. Yes, mm -hmm. And you know yeah. what you know. Yeah. Um, but I think our education and, Forums like this hopefully get this information out for yeah. you to equip yourself and understand how to protect yourself so that we can end this epidemic, yes. you yes. know, among our people. Thank you. So mm -hmm. as we wrap up, I have one last question for you both. And you guys can look at the camera if you want. Mm -hmm. Why was today important for you to come in and to have a conversation about pregnancy and HIV? Why, why are you here today? Why are you here today? I just want to say it was very important for me to come and share my story because I hope to inspire somebody and help and even let some people know that HIV is not the end all, mm -hmm. you know, because you can you can live a healthy life afterwards. And not only that, you know, there you can still look to the future, you know, um, also um, you want people to know that um, if there ever was a time to be HIV positive, it's now. Okay. Because there's so many different things that can help you. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? When 27 years ago, the medication wasn't as good, you know, mm -hmm. and you had so many side effects and it was, even the medication was causing death. Mm -hmm. But we have a very, very 
broad arsenal now and mm -hmm. people can stay undetectable. And the um, bottom line is a person who's HIV positive can live just as long as someone who's not. That's true. Yes. So that and does not affect. Yeah. Right? So that does not affect the lifespan anymore. So it's important for us to come and be able to talk about our journey and how we got through it and maybe inspire some other people to get through it as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What about you, Ms. Martha? Oh, I, I wasn't going to miss this opportunity for the world. Um, my beautiful children inspire me to get up every day. Mm -hmm. um, and it's getting harder to get up every day. <laughs> uh, but I think like Miss Robin said, there are some young people out there that need to hear us, yes. mm -hmm. uh, hear our stories, and know that there's absolutely nothing impossible for their lives. Mm -hmm. um, not just for pride, you can have your babies, but there's so much more out there as well um, that you can do and accomplish, that you're special mm -hmm. and that you're loved, mm -hmm. uh, no matter what anybody tells you. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you've heard it, folks. Another great episode of Positive Voices. Mm -hmm. We had two amazing moms sit down and share their journey with us. Um, they talked about statistics, right? And you're like, well, that's a lot of numbers. Where can I find it? You can head on over to the website, link, L-I-N-K, capital U, um, DMV. Dot org. OK, go there, type your zip code in. You'll have a cluster of resources pop up for you. Education is key because that's what our guests have told us today. You also can head to another website. You can head to DCN's HIV forward slash uh, dot org, excuse me, forward slash podcast. Click the link up top. Take a survey. You can re watch more episodes, but you also can find out some more about what we were talking about this season mm -hmm. and connect with us. Like, share, subscribe, comment, because we want to know your thoughts. The guests will be looking back to kind of do some more feedback with you as well. And we'll see you guys on another episode of, Pos of Positive Voices. I'm T. I'm Malachi. And we had our guests here today. Robin. And, and Martha. Yes. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.